Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, who keeps truth forever and never forsakes the works of his own hands. Peace be to the brethren in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all of them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Dear congregation, we worship the Lord this afternoon singing Psalter 222, stanzas 1 through 5 of 222. Now to God our strength and Savior, render praise and loudly sing, in our Father's God rejoicing, all your noblest music bring and following. Our scripture reading this afternoon is from the book of Proverbs. We'll be reading chapter 31, the very last portion of Proverbs, beginning in verse 10 to the end of the chapter. Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10. Hear God's true and eternal word. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax, And worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night. And giveth meat to her household. And a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field. And buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength. And strengtheneth. Her arms, she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, 
for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Amen. May God bless the reading of his own word. And we sing together in response to God's word, Psalter 359, and standing, if you may, 359. We confess now our faith with the church of all ages in the first few pages in the back of our Psalter, according to the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Now we join our hearts together in prayer. Um, an announcement that, that is not in the bulletin, but to take note is that tomorrow, next week, Sunday at 7 p.m. after um, the p.m. service, there will be the hymn sing, the young people's hymn sing, where we have other young people from other churches coming. So it's next Lord's Day, 7 p.m. Let us then join our, our hearts together in prayer. Our gracious and glorious God, our creator and our maker, our redeemer and our Lord, we come this afternoon again to acknowledge that Thou art God, that Thou art our maker, that Thou art worthy of our praise and our love and our attention. And we plead, Lord, that Thou would receive our worship that Thou would receive it through the sacrifice of Thy Son. We know, Lord, that we could not have an access to Thee if it were not the sacrifice of Jesus. We read this morning that when Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to bottom in the holy place, between the holy place and the holy of holies. And, Lord, we know and understand that because Jesus died on the cross... We have this access to Thee through our Redeemer's shed blood. He had to be our sacrifice. We needed the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world so that we could come and worship Thee in an acceptable way without the need of, of those sacrifices of old, without the need of a human priest to intercede for us. We have now He who is human and divine interceding for us, our high priest, our supreme high priest in heaven, being our mediator even now. And we even understand, Lord, that our access to Thee still is through a mediator, only He is in heaven, the Lord Jesus. So through Thee, Lord Jesus... We come to God and we thank Thee, Lord, for this privilege. Help us to acknowledge, Lord. Help us not take for granted that this is a privilege that is unheard. If it weren't for Jesus, we could not be here. Our worship would not be received. It would not be blessed. It would not be pure. We, we would not even have a desire to be here. But through Jesus... Our very prayers ascend, even as those prayers of old ascended with the incense and arrived in heaven at thy very hearing. Help us to understand this reality, Lord. Minister to the little children among us and to us as adults to, to realize that in worship we are joining in a spiritual way by faith all of the church militant um, I mean, all of the church triumphant, along with the heavenly host, angels and men and women, souls made perfect in thy presence. We still as the church militant, but joining the hearts of the heavenly host, worshiping our God in heaven. We pray, O oh Lord, help us to understand something of this great privilege, that this is a heavenly moment, that this is a heavenly um, opportunity. And we plead, Lord, that Thou would forgive us of all our sins. We, we then acknowledge that we cannot be um, in heaven. We cannot have our very prayers in heaven. We cannot have our worship accepted in heaven if we are harboring sin, if our sins are not pardoned and cleansed. So please, Lord, do this. Please forgive us. Cleanse us through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that thou would graciously bless every heart among us. And even as we consider, Lord, this topic before us of a, of a virtuous woman, that the very thought that this book full of, of principles of wisdom, it, it ends with, with this detailed account of a virtuous woman. And we see, Lord, that this is wisdom that is embodied and, and it helps us understand, Lord, that 
It is possible to live a life of wisdom, a life of fearing the Lord. And we pray, Lord, that both men and women, all of us, would seek this diligent, godly, virtuous kind of life. We pray, Lord, that Thou would bless our mothers. We thank Thee, Lord, for them. We thank Thee for wives and mothers, and that Thou hast given, Lord, this gift, not only to the church, but to the whole world, that fatherhood and motherhood, um, husbands and wives, the very foundation of a family, and then children that come forth. We thank Thee, Lord, for the gift of family. And we pray, Lord, that Thou would bless every family in our congregation. Thou knowest, Lord, the struggles that there are. Thou knowest, Lord, the, the, what weighs in every family's heart, husbands or wives, with the different afflictions that they have to face. And we plead, Lord, that Thou then would, would comfort and guide and provide. And Lord, for all those who may be living their lives and with their families where things are not following as thy word does set forth as the ideal, we pray that then Christ would be their comfort. For Christ is our Savior and our Lord and he's the one who, who, who completes us and who fulfills us and who forgives us in our sins and who covers us with his perfect righteousness. So, Lord, in everything wanting, may it lead us to Christ, even as we read this and realize, Lord, that we do not have these virtues. And, and if there is one, it's not enough, or, or it, we may be blessed with one of these characters, and yet we feel we are so weak in them. But, Lord, again, may it drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ, for we see, Lord, this, this is a picture of Christ himself. This is who Jesus is. Um, this is a Christ-like wife and mother. And so we thank Thee, Lord Jesus, that we have Thee to forgive us of all of our weaknesses, all of our imperfections, all of our sins. And we do thank Thee for a portion like this in Scripture that can remind us of the great and blessed gift of motherhood and that we would be grateful. And we do thank Thee, Lord, for our mothers and pray that thou would bless them and strengthen them and for the for the wives who would desire to yet be mothers there too lord we we come to thee for that um, blessing that thou would be the one to provide and and to guide and there may be girls or young men who would like to be husbands and, and wives and then fathers and mothers. And we commend them all to Thee, Lord, that, that Thou would use this very passage to encourage them who they are to seek after, what they are to seek to be like. And again, that they would look to Christ to provide all that they need and to guide them and to understand that who we need first and foremost is Jesus. Um, salvation, and that we would be found in Him complete. Lord, we thank Thee for the beautiful figure of Christ as the bridegroom and, and Thy church as, as the bride, and how we find even in, in salvation this picture of, of, of marriage and married life. And we thank Thee, Lord Jesus, for being a husband who is ever faithful, who is perfect, who loves us with a love that is truly sacrificial to the, to the greatest degree, for thou art the one who did give thy life for thy church, for thy wife. And we thank thee, Lord, for washing us with the word, for thou art the word of God made flesh. And everything that flows from thy lips is true and perfect and cleansing. And so we thank thee, Lord Jesus, we thank Thee, Lord, for this opportunity to hear Thy Word. Please bless Thy Word as it is proclaimed, and bless as we receive it. And Lord, we pray also that Thou would bless um, every family among us and all the different needs. We, we do thank Thee for this hymn sing next Lord's Day at 7 p.m. Bless, Lord, the lives of each of our young um, people. Bless them and their jobs and their school and whatever um, endeavor they are in and in their families that they would seek godliness above all things 
that they would yearn to, to glorify Thee in their lives. Lord, we pray that Thou would bless um, Brenda Vandervoek. We thank, Lord, of her life and commend her to Thee for, for the rest that she needs, that through the nights she may have the sleep that is necessary for her, and that Thou would bless her um, um, mind in the process of her thinking and that Christ would ever be um, precious and foremost to her and bless those who care and take time to spend with her. Be with Steve also as her husband. We thank thee for his life and pray, Lord, that thou would strengthen him, provide for him, and undergird him. And Lord, we, we ask also that Thou would be with all the PRTS students who graduated last Friday. We thank Thee, Lord, for their lives. And as they go to their places, um, their congregations, their respective cities or countries even, that Thou would use them and that they would be as arrows in this world um, sent forth with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank, Lord, of the HRC students, John Bile and Isaac Epp and Martine High Boer, that that would be, Lord, with each one of them, and, and Daryl Dietert as well. Use them, Lord. Guide them. Give them wisdom now as to what would be next. Be with Synod and, and where they would be considered um, um, callable and receive perhaps a call. Please go before them, Lord. Bless their wives and all their families. Lord, we also pray for the Crows. Be with Jason and Wilhelmina, and as they minister to the people of, of Haiti, we pray, Lord, that Thou would provide and protect in all their many um, travels um, as they minister also for the ministry hungry for life. Lord, please be with them and provide and be with their children as well, Jaden and Justin and Alexander, as, as they grow and as they um, go um, even, even pretty soon to, to, to college. We pray, O oh Lord, go before them and protect them. We pray that Thou would use this ministry in a very powerful way. Lord, we also pray for Pastor Mike Fintelman. We thank Thee for his ministry at the Plymouth HRC in Wisconsin. We pray that thou would bless him as their pastor, be with the elders and deacons there, adding to their numbers, blessing, Lord, this congregation. Be, Lord, also with Nellie. We thank thee for answering prayers of many years, even decades, where she has finally received um, a liver transplant. She's been doing well, and we trust, Lord, that she would continue to recover and, and be well and healthy after the surgery. We pray, Lord, that Thou would bless our elders and deacons. We thank Thee for their lives, Lord, and how we need Thy help to shepherd this flock. Give us wisdom, Lord, and guidance, wisdom from above, and, and the tender care of, of Christ's shepherding love as we shepherd this congregation, to love Thee and to serve Thee and to obey Thee. And we ask, Lord, all these things in Jesus' name and for Thine honor and glory. Amen. Amen. We'll be having our offerings at this time and we'll be singing Psalter 65 um, and all stanzas in standing, if you may, following... Um, the giving of our offering, Psalter 65.
mothers and wives. God's word has a lot to say who a wife is to be, who a mother is to be. The very book that is called a book of wisdom ends with this section that we have read, verses 10 through 31, that describes who the virtuous woman is. And this is very helpful. And even though I know um, when I put myself in, a, in the place of, of my own wife reading a passage like this, there, there is always that sense of, in a sense, heaviness because we feel, do, do, do I measure up? to what God is putting out at a stand, as a standard. And what I hope to do is to show to you through Scripture itself as we, as we expose this passage that there is an astonishing freeing element because this is God's Word, so we know it is trustworthy. However high the standards of God's Word, they are always true and they are always good. And so it will always be freeing as well because it pleases God. And God always gives what we need in order to glorify Him. And so as we look at this passage, one one first thing to notice is it's in the Hebrew, it is an acrostic from verses 10 through 31. It literally has every Hebrew letter of the alphabet to every verse. So the sense that we have is that God wants us to see, in essence, from A to Z, who a virtuous woman is. Um, This is what this passage is here for. It is is from chapter 31, where where the, the mother of King Lemuel is basically teaching him who is the virtuous woman that he should consider in order to marry. And it immediately does this to whoever hears and reads this passage. If you are a young woman, it is teaching you who you are to be like. If you are a married woman, it is teaching you who you are to be like. If you are a a young man who is Still single, it is teaching you the kind of woman you are to search for. But then immediately it teaches you as well, if you're a young unmarried man, still the kind of man you're supposed to be. Because if you're searching for this virtuous woman, she will not accept the invitations of a non-virtuous man. And if you are a married man, you look at this passage and you are being told how you are to live in your life to foster a home in which your wife would feel comfortable and helped to be this virtuous woman. Um, Every one of us will look at this passage and find an element whereby um, you are being taught. There's application for everyone, not just for wives, not just for for mothers, the, 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 This whole section is divided very simply into three and in a classical way. The, the first few verses are an introduction and, and it shows the value of a virtuous woman. It's, it's established right at the beginning. That will be our first point, her value. The, the second part is, is the body of this whole passage and it shows... Um, Who this virtuous woman is. Basically, it will define what virtue is. Um, It says a virtuous woman, and you're wondering, well, well, who is this virtuous woman? It'll describe um, what God's word means by virtue. And then the last part, the last few verses, are a conclusion. Um, That's what I meant by a classical division. A lot of things that we write have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. This little portion does as well. In the conclusion, it's, it's a very natural reality. It is the praise that this virtuous woman is worthy to receive. A praise that you and I must give. It, it, it flows out of our hearts because it, it, it is demanding of this praise. That's our conclusion. It will be the third point, her praise. And so, first of all, let us begin the first point, her value. And 
The first thing I want to look at here is, is the word virtuous. Who can find a virtuous woman? And just to define that word virtuous, it, it is a word that echoes from the military world the idea of, of strength and the idea of, of the heroic. This is literally speaking of, of a woman who's a hero in the eyes of people who know her because of who she is and what she does. The, the word strength and the word, um, even the word might and even the word wealth are all connected in this word. So we have in the King James the translation virtuous. Some other translations are an excellent wife or a woman of noble character. Um, Jerome, from the years 300, he coined the phrase simply a strong woman. And what is amazing is as we look at this passage and we compare our world to God's world and we start evaluating what our world tells us about a strong woman or a virtuous woman and what God's word tells us, what, what we find, and, and this is where, where error is always very dangerous, there are things that are not off. It's just the emphasis that is. And so first, first of all, there are certain emphases from God's word that we do not find in the world. So, for example, one emphasis in God's word is clearly, as we read this, that caring for one's children and husband is first and foremost. And the world certainly does not put that primacy to motherhood or for a wife. But then there are certain emphases um, which God's word does not give, but the world does. So the world, what the world emphasizes is beauty and academics, or you could say appearance and achievement. And, and in achi See, even when you say the word achievement, you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Because this world, achieve, this woman in, in Proverbs achieves astonishingly a lot. And the world puts a big premise, a, a big um, emphasis on the achievement. But the achievement typically outside of the home. And so what we start finding is that it's really a matter of emphasis. And as you start realizing that, you can come up with one understanding that God's word is fair and it is generous. And you'll see what I mean. You look at the world and literally it is ruthless and confusing. Because the world will put a priority on the career. A woman's career is her priority in the eyes of the world. In, in God's word, the priority is the home. But today is Mother's Day. And mothers all over America and the world are being praised for being a mother. And there is this rhetoric in the world. Mothers are seen as heroes. They are given gratitude. They are praised. But then mothers in the world are told the next day, tomorrow is Monday. And you might open a magazine and you'll see that the people who are lauded, the women who are lauded, are those who rose to the top of their level in their career. And the accolades and the praise... And you're thinking, wow, yesterday was Mother's Day and I was praised, but now I open this magazine and that woman in her career is praised. And then you look at the family of that woman and it's all a mess. The children don't care for her. She doesn't care for them. And you're wondering, why does the world praise motherhood but praise this mother as well? And, and mothers are very confused because on one hand they're praised, on the other they're, they, they hear things like this. There's, there's one feminist from the University of Illinois, Vivian Gornick, who said this, being a housewife is an illegitimate profession. An illegitimate profession. But look what God's Word does. God's Word is showing that a virtuous woman has value. Her price is far above rubies. 
And then if we look at everything, and we're going to see it more in detail in our second point, that the, the things that she does in terms of achievement, in terms of rising, in terms of, 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 of the things that she does and the praise that she deserves, and even in terms of a career reality, it's just amazing. But this is the reality of Scripture. There's a priority. See, does, she doesn't plant that vineyard and she doesn't make those clothings for the sake of a career and for the sake of a home, a name outside. It is all for the sake of the home. The home is primary in her heart. When the praise comes, there's really nothing in the sense of praise from the world. It is inevitable that it might come from those merchants who buy her belts. Maybe they'll come and thank her. But, but the last part, our conclusion, it is all the home that is praising. They love their mom. So it's clear that her heart is there. And yes, the, God's word does not say it's wrong to work even outside of the home. But this woman who works outside of the home does that for the sake of the home. And so this is what I mean about God's word being generous. It it doesn't say that a career is a sin for a woman. But it does say the home should be the center of your heart. And if you have time perhaps for a career, let that career be for the home. And at the same time, and notice how there's an equality. A man, okay, he has a career, but that career should be 100% for the home. A man, this man shows up in this passage a few places, but it's not like he has another life. That home is his life. And at the end, we find him praising his wife. So both wife and husband, they live 100% for the family, for one another. They're both sacrificing. They're maybe even sacrificing higher names in the career world out there because it doesn't matter out there. What matters is the home for both mom and dad, for the wife and the husband. And this is the value that is put forth, that is hard to find. When we think of that little phrase, who can find? It does give this sense, beloved, of of a preciousness like like a jewel that is hard to find because there are not too many. Because what it takes is this mind to simply understand it's, it's very simple. It's a matter of sacrifice. You can do all the work that you can possibly achieve, and a man as well, but as long as the home is where your heart is. And you be honest. So if a man can't take a second job because the home will be deprived, well, then don't because the home is where you need to show love. You need to be there for that woman to also be virtuous. And if, and if she can't buy that field, then don't buy it and just stay at home and take care of all the things there. You will still be blessed and still be praised. See, that's the whole gist of this whole passage. But not the world. The world will confuse you. It will praise the mothers. But tomorrow is Monday, and the mothers who stay home take care of their family because they love, and they really can't have a mind for another career, and home is really where she prefers to be. The world will say what that feminist says to you. And so, see, it's so cruel. They praise a mother, but then they praise the career woman who who doesn't even want to be a mother, who maybe has children but doesn't really care for them. The world praises that mother. But then you know what the world does? When the children are not obeying, when the children are not following, the the world will turn around and also condemn her for not being a good mother after all. Because comes next year, come next year, Mother's Day, mothers will be praised again. And what will those moms feel when they see that things aren't so well? See, God's word is generous. It's saying, no, we can do all that perhaps we're able to do, but there's a balance. And the center is to be the home. So this is our our first point. And and, and before we go to our first point, I do want to say this one thing. When, When we find this phrase, who can find a virtuous woman, that does not mean that there are many virtuous men, as if only virtuous women are what we need to look for. This very book 
In Proverbs 20, verse 6, this is an important passage for us men to write down. Proverbs 20, verse 6, is in a way the other side of Proverbs 31, verse 10. It says, most men, um, excuse me, um, yes, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find So we are searching for faithful men and for virtuous women. We as Christians are supposed to find in Christ who we need to be exactly this. And so the value, the value is established. If you seek these characteristics that we will look at now, all through Christ and through His mediation and through His forgiveness and and what we don't measure up and through His Holy Spirit to give us the power. Young men, if you look for a wife like this, you will find a wife like this. God, God has provided women with this kind of heart. And women, this is the kind of heart that God's Word teaches you to have. So our second point, her work and character. And and we will look here, putting together some of these qualities and activities into seven, there are at least seven different characters, seven different elements of virtue. Some of these, they're connected to each other, but these words help complement the total picture of, of a virtuous wife. The first word is trustworthy love. Especially because of verse 11, it says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. He trusts her. And that means that he entrusts everything to her. A man in those days, and and it's of course connected, the principles are the same today, he could not marry unless he had a property through which He could support her and also in which it could be her home. And then he would go out to work and whatever was part of that property, and remember it could have been even connected to his own father's property. There there was a lot of assets. There were a lot of even workers, maybe land and maybe produce. And, And God's word is basically saying this man trusted her with all of that, with his assets, with his resources, even future children, with, with clothing, with accounts, with workers, if there were there, how many, how many there would have been there, with the produce, with accounts, with cash. And he had no reason to suspect her managing of all of that. You know, there's a danger of mismanagement. There's a danger of squandering it. There's a danger of wasting it. But he loved her. Because he trusted her. But see, it was a trust that she evoked from him because of her character. Trustworthy love. And then secondly, going on to verse 12, we we can say sacrificial service. Now, many of the things she does could be in that category of sacrifice, sacrificial service. Look at verse 12 first. She will do him good and not evil. All the days of her life. See, again, the propaganda of today is do good to yourself first. and Don't worry about others. Do first good to yourself. This is a woman who will do her husband good and not evil. See, that is a desire in her heart. And as soon as you do good to others, that is a sacrificial thing. You are serving. You're not getting she has a sacrificial heart. Now, now look, let's look at her work with wool and even flax. In, in verse 13 it says, She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Later in verse 19 it, it shows where, where this wool is going. Um, it says in verse 19, She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. And that the, these two tools are connected to the wool and what will happen with that wool. This, this cloth making in those days, were, you, you may be seeing the pictures, maybe you've read about it. It was extremely difficult. You had to be raised in it. If, if we are at an age of maybe 17 or 18 and we're going to learn how to spin 
a, a, a thread. It, it is the hardest thing. You need technique. You need hours of work, devotion. You can imagine little girls would be by the mama, seeing the mama do it for several years, and then, then they would start trying it themselves. And, and, and the process was so laborious. Um, it, if you had the sheep, well, it would have to start by shearing them. If you didn't have the sheep, you would go and buy the wool. And you could buy the wool at different phases. If you bought the wool raw, you would have to then get the wool, first clean it, get rid of all of the dirt and all of the oil that comes in it. So it had to be washed, washed in a way that would get the lanolin off. You could use the lanolin for something. Um, and then you would, would, would um, card or comb the wool. You would put that wool in the distaff. The distaff would be that part that would use the wool that would be all kind of in a, in a combed way. And then you would put it somehow into a little connected thin um, part. And as the spindle spinned, that wool would be spun into the spindle. Now, this is where the, the hard part is. It's kind of easy to get a lot of wool and make it thick into the spindle. It's very hard to make it very thin into the spindle because if it's very, very thin, it can break and you have to just attach it all over again. And, and the, the art would be to make it as thin as a thread as possible and yet not break. After you had all your wool into a yarn format, then you had to weave it. After you had a big fabric, you had to cut it and sew it together for clothing. And either you would dye the wool before, right after it was raw, or you could dye the garment itself. And this lady would dye it with scarlet and with purple, which was known to be some of the most royal and expensive dyes. And so this is why I say sacrificial service. Even though it was part of the way of living for them, it was still sacrificial. You still had to wake up early to do it. There, there's some records of how some ladies, if they went to visit others, they would take their spindle and distaff so that as they're visiting, they're doing their wool and making their yarn. They, they had to use their time. They, there, there was no, 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 no factories like today that you could just go and buy something completely ready. Every home was in many ways a little a cottage factory for the clothing of the family. And some were as productive as this where she produced so much that she was able to sell it. And that was where her career, in a sense, was beyond the home. Sacrificial service. And not just the work with wool, verse 14, also the work with food. It says, she is like the merchant ship, she bringeth her food from afar. And, and again, um, of course, we can go to one supermarket and get something. And you know how to, even in our reality, you, you need to go to one supermarket for certain things, but then you have to go to some markets for other things. And then maybe to a big market for the bulk things. And even we have some sort of going closer or farther depending on the things that we're purchasing. And it's the same mindset in, in those days, only it would be further and, and perhaps without even an animal, maybe walking and to find a certain produce, maybe a village sold certain things that your village didn't produce and so you had to go far and, and you would take some of your things to trade or the silver and be the money to buy from that other place. She was sacrificial even in how she prepared food. There were no frozen servings in those days. And in the serving of food, not just the preparing it. Look at verse 15. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So uh, she woke up early to, to prepare food to give to her household. Now there, there's something very interesting about this verse um, which is the word meat. When it says that she gives meat to her household it could even be translated to give a prey the image here of this woman now is like a lioness who is caring for her cubs. It's like her home is like that cave with the little cubs and she will take care of them and bring the prey for the little cubs. When it says meat, it's the word prey. 
So it's really putting her in this picture of this protective mother and not just of the children, but even of the servants. And, and this turns something around in our minds because when we think that a, a person would be rich enough to have servants, they're the ones who wake up early to feed the masters and the, and the, and the, the, the employers. But no, it's, it's the opposite. And this, this is the opposite because our minds have been affected by the secular ethics format. The Jewish and biblical ethics is this. It doesn't matter if you're rich. Work is good. And this goes to our fourth virtue, which is devoted diligence. Now, I want to bring this one here because this is what we see with this woman who has servants but she wakes up early to protect her, her, her little cubs and, and gives them food and even to the service. This is diligence. This is devoted diligence. She cares even for the servants who are there to care for her. And, and I was going to say how this follow the Jewish and, and biblical ethics of work. That wealth does not exclude hard work. It includes it. It's part of life. Um, look at the examples we have in God's word. Abraham, the Bible says, was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. That's in Genesis 13. And then we read in Genesis, um, in Genesis, I didn't put the passage here of, of it's, Later in Genesis, we read that he went with his armed men to protect Lot, to bring Lot back. Remember, the servants who were born in his home that he armed were 318. Abraham was an astonishingly wealthy man. But then we read this in Genesis 18, verse 6. Remember when Jesus comes with the two angels and he wants to serve them food. We read that Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran into the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man. And he hasted to dress it. And he, meaning Abraham, took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. This, this is a, a, a wealthy man, and he is working as one of the servants. And he puts his wife to work as one of the servants. See, in, in God's world, in God's word, wealth and hard work go right side by side. It doesn't matter if we're wealthy. Hard work is still part of what we do. It's really the secular pagan world that was parallel to God's world that, that had the mindset, if you were royal, if you were high, if you were rich and you had your servants, they work hard for you. You don't get dirty. You stay with your beautiful clothes. That's not God's way. Think of the priest. Yes, he would have linen and he would have a certain clothing for the Day of Atonement. But when it was the day-to-day -day and he had to get the sacrifices, he would have blood and, and smell with, with the smell of sacrificed animals all day long. This is who this woman is. She is a hard worker. She's diligent. She's rich. Because she has a lot of substance. She has money to buy a field. But she's working hard. A diligence that produces good things. Verse 18, it says, She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goes not out by night. She's diligent in making sure she even stays up late until she finishes what she needs to do. And the world has the audacity to call homemaking and illegitimate work? You, you see, this, this is the secular world. They look at homemaking. If any mother knows that homemaking is hard work, and for this woman in some college to call it illegitimate work, see, that's the heart of the world. That's not the heart of God. This is legitimate work. This is beautiful work. 
So there's trustworthy love, sacrificial service, devoted diligence. And then fourthly, she has a generous heart. Now notice her generosity, how it flows. It's not really in terms of priority of who's more important. But it's, it, it starts in a sense of how it overflows from the home. And her generosity goes from out there. She serves those who are out there and serves those who are in here. And this is verse 20. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. The, the reacheth forth does, it gives a sense that she's not just helping the poor that are nearby. She's helping the poor that are farther off. And she's not just helping the poor that knock at her door. She's knocking at the door of some poor because she needs to go help them there. That's a generosity to the poor. And then verse 21, it is a generosity to her own children. Um, It says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She, She clothes them all. She keeps them all nice and warm. And then verse 22, it's a generosity even to the home and to herself. Look, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. And and here is an element that I mean to say that God's word is generous. It is not saying just do all these things to others and forget about yourself completely. No, she dresses herself in a noble and dignified way. Here it even shows, again, that sense of priority. The world says beauty is a priority. God's word is generous. It doesn't throw beauty away. It only says there's a place for beauty. But it's just not a priority. You notice what God's word is doing? The, The world says homemaking is not a legitimate work. God's word says homemaking is a priority. But look how generous. God's word doesn't say working outside is illegitimate for a wife. No, God says working outside, there's a place. It's just not the priority. See, the world puts those things in priority, beauty and working for the world for a name. God's word says, no, beauty has a place. You you can make clothes of purple and wear it. But you see, it's not the priority for this woman. But she will dress well. Because it's it's part of being a Christian. Dress dignified. In an honorable way. This is what I mean about it being freeing. She's not legalistic. She's not saying I need to be locked in the home and no one can see me and I mean it need to be I need to be badly dressed or else it will look like I'm vain. No. There's a freeing element. She can as he's, as she's making these clothes these clothes for everyone, she can make purple clothes for herself. And and for us we need to understand purple clothes for those days literally meant wealthy clothes. Because both the scarlet and purple um, were dyes that were very expensive. The purple especially came from seashells from the coast off of Phoenicia. It was very expensive. Um, And yet she made it for herself. This is what I mean about freeing. See, God's word is not saying for you to be a virtuous wife, you're going to have to look like you're poor because you're serving everyone else. No. You can look dignified. You will be generous even to yourself in this very measured way. It's it's like us going to the table and eating. We are being generous to ourselves. We're not living like septics saying, I'm going to suffer for the sake of Christ every day. No, we're going to be generous. We're going to sleep. We're going to eat. We're going to dress well. That's who she is. She's very balanced. And then verse 23, it says, Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. So you notice she blesses the poor with food. She blesses her children with clothing. She blesses herself with coverings of tapestry. That that would be for the bed. It would be like a bedspread and, and pillows and even clothing that would be dignified because she's balanced. She's not legalistic. And she blesses her husband because she's living in a way where the men out there know him. And in the gates, that, of course, indicates the reality that this man is in the leadership of the town. 
and the gates always meant basically the city council. And I've heard one pastor say that this is the reality, this is the idea almost where that man is known because of his wife. It is as if she is a crown for him. Um, it is like Proverbs 12, 4 says, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. And it is as if people say, that is so-and-so's husband. Now, who is that man? Oh, don't you know? He's married to so-and-so. That's kind of the gist of this passage. And in this way, he is blessed. He is known. And then verse 24 says, She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. So here comes the reality that's really astonishing. She's blessing, you could say, the global economy of her village and surroundings. She's providing clothing in a day where clothing was very hard to get by. Hers was one of the little cottage factories that was really keeping the villages nearby, you could say, stable. So she was blessing society. Blessing the poor, blessing her children, blessing herself, blessing her husband, even blessing others. But you see, you, you look at the heart of this, and it is the family. She's not doing this for a name. She's not doing this because what mean, matters to her is, is her position in society. Her position in the home is her heart. So a generous heart is number four. And then number five is a joyful confidence. Now, because of two verses, verse 21 said she's not afraid of the snow for her household. See, if she sees that it might snow in the future, she's confident. She's not afraid because they're all well-dressed. They're, they're all cozy in their comfortable scarlet clothing. And then verse 25, it, it says this, Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. It can even be translated, she will laugh for the future. See, the future doesn't bring her fear like, oh, will I have money? Oh, will things go well? Will I run out of clothing? No, she's joyfully confident. She's not worried because things are all provided for. Trustworthy love, sacrificial service, devoted diligence, a generous heart. Number five is joyful confidence. And then number six, we could say loving instruction. It's because of verse 26. It says, she opens her mouth with wisdom. That's the, that's the instruction. It's, it's wise. But then it says, in her tongue is the law of kindness. That's the love. That's why loving instruction the word law of kindness is like teaching in a loving way. She doesn't just talk about wisdom. She lives wisdom. And all of us understand what this means because all of us have been through school. And we all know that there are teachers that seem to love me. There are teachers who seem to not. And when you remember the teachers of the past, perhaps the name that will come to your mind, when I was preparing this, my first grade teacher came to my mind and my third grade teacher came to my mind because first grade was, was a shock for me. I was five years old. I didn't know English too well and I was in an American school and this sweet teacher talked to me and comforted my heart. Mrs. Heller in um, Peoria Heinz, Peoria High School, uh, Heinz High School in Peoria. And Mrs. Heller wrote me letters when I was back in Brazil, maybe all the way till I was in seventh grade. Mrs. Heller, why, why do I remember her name? Because she taught me with the law of kindness. 
And then I remember Mrs. Sickles because in third grade in Brazil, I went from one American school to another one, and it was everyone knew. I was in third grade. There was that fear of, oh, no, everyone's new. I don't know everybody. And Mrs. Sickles was my first teacher. And I, I remember until today, we, we sat in class, and she said, who has a prayer request? And I, I, I felt like I was in heaven. I'm, I'm in school, and the teacher will pray. And she treated me with love and with kindness. Now, you might remember those teachers who were a little impatient or even mean. While I was preparing this, I also thought of a few names. But then there wasn't a heart of warmth. There was a cringing in my heart. Why? Because it perhaps was a lot of wisdom. She taught me a lot of truth, but it didn't have the law of kindness with it. But the virtuous woman has both wisdom and kindness, loving instruction. And then seventh, the last virtue here in the whole body is diligent vigilance. In, in verse 27, it says, She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. This looketh well is, is a very important word. It's, here, the word looketh well is a lot like the word for bishop, for elders. You know, the episcopos word that has that idea that an elder is to be up in a tower looking at the flock to make sure he's well. Well, this is who this woman is. She is looking well to the ways of her household. See the household. It is central. She's not thinking of the stock market first and foremost. She's not thinking of the highest position in a job out there. She is looking for the welfare of her household. It's the idea of a, of a careful watchfulness, a, a keeping track of any need. And beloved, nowadays, it would be a mom who's there checking what are my children seeing in the Internet. It, it is a mother who is checking, you know, how are you doing in school? Let's sit down and talk. It is, it is praying with children, conversing with the husband, finding a difficulty in the home that's not being solved and saying, we need to sit down and talk because I'm seeing a pattern. And this does not seem well. See, for the well-being of this household, we need to do something about this. It's a diligent vigilance. Now, these are the seven um, characters that are in the body. Now, in our third point, let me move to her praise. And in her praise, we will find the eighth, which is the foundation of it all where all these virtues come from. And, and I want to read this portion all together in verse 28. This is the conclusion. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. This is why this is called her praise. It, it, there is praise here that is showing forth from especially those very people who she's blessing. Remember, she was generous to the poor, to her children, to her husband. Well, these very ones are the ones now here and the ones that matter most in her household who come and bring her praise. The children bless her. And children, this is where the application comes for, for your heart. What does it mean to bless your mom? The word blessed means happiness. So it literally means to make your mother happy. And you know how to make her happy. And you know how to make her sad. Why are you to make her happy? See, it's an act of gratitude to them. Who is your mom to you? They feed you. They clothe you. They pray for you or with you. They guide you. They train you. They're patient with you. They're loving to you. So what are you to do? You are to be patient with them. 
You are to thank them. You are to love them and bless them and make them happy. Now, husbands, it says in verse um, 28, her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. See, there's blessing and praise from children. There's blessing and praise from the husbands. And, And this could be an application for us as husbands. There are two things that husbands are to do. They are to bless and to praise put together. Of course, this applies to the children too. They are to also praise and say, Mom, I love what you have done. That's your praise to your mom. And husbands, we need to remember to bless our wives, which means to make them happy, and to praise them, which means to show them how grateful we are. To bless them and to praise them. And this is where where we need God's grace, isn't it? Because as husbands, we know that we have not been grateful as we should. And we have not praised as we should. And there may be moms or wives thinking, I have not been this way as I should. But this is where... Again, this is why I meant that this is very encouraging and freeing. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. This is who Jesus is. If I if I look at if I list all of those virtues again, trustworthy, none more trustworthy than Jesus. Sacrificial. We saw this morning Jesus giving his life and entrusting his soul to the Father. Devoted diligence, none more devoted and diligent than Jesus. Generous in heart, Jesus gave his generosity to to all and every one of his own. When you think of Jesus as as, um, the Savior and all of us as his subjects, we have been the poor ones who have been blessed by his stretched forth hand to bless the needy. And then these, these last virtues of, of joyful confidence and loving instruction and diligent vigilance, this is who Jesus is. And this is whom we need to have these very virtues. We need Christ. Now, I said I was going to say the, the, the found, founding principle from which all of these virtues come from, and it comes from verse 30. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. The fear of the Lord. See, this woman isn't just virtuous in all those ways. She's also godly. She is pious. She knows the Lord. She's saved. All of these things, there may be women in the world who don't know Jesus who can be quite sacrificial and quite hardworking and achieve many things. But their hearts are crying for help because they know they're not sufficient. When you fear the Lord, it means that you trust your sacrifice, your substitute. You trust the one who will forgive you for all your sins. Who will forgive you, husbands, for not having praised your wives as you should have. For not having blessed them as you should. And who will forgive you, wives and mothers, for not having followed all these principles. Jesus, he cleanses us and pardons us. And gives us the strength to be this virtuous. And to... Be as a man virtuous for a wife that you're looking for that has this virtue. And as a husband thinking, I I want my wife this virtuous, but am I this virtuous? Well, in Christ, we find this virtue. And I want to also, just in closing, summarize all that I have said into one word, one virtue. See, fear of the Lord is the founding virtue from all that all these things flow from. But if I were to summarize all of them into one word, there is a word. God's word makes this abundantly clear. It's the word love. Because all of these virtues is in essence obeying God and, and 
law, the loving God is really the summary of all the commands. This is a woman who loves. And when children praise and when husbands bless their wives, they are loving them back. And, and moms, I just want to leave you with this great encouragement. Never underestimate the power of a motherly love. This mother loved her family in an astonishing way. Everything was her family. And, and I just want to end with one illustration from a mother who loved so much that she became this, this example of Christ to her son. And it's not that she, of course, didn't save her son, but God used the example of a loving mother to save a son. This is the example, the illustration from Edith Schaefer. You know, she, she was the wife of Francis Schaefer, the one man who had the Labrie ministry in Switzerland. Well, Edith and Francis had a son, Eric Schaefer, who became an atheist, a self-proclaimed atheist. And yet, he was greatly loved by his mom. And later, he even became converted. And this is his witness. Just a few little excerpts of what he wrote um, in, in view of her mom, his mom having died. He said, Mother was a force to be reckoned with, a whole energetic universe contained in one trim little female frame. And she used that entire force for good. These are some memories. Mother in the garden at dawn, weeding and watering her wonderful flowers and vegetables. Mother typing up a storm while writing her thousands of letters and dozens of books. Mother so pleased that her good friend Betty Ford invited her to the White House to swim laps with her in the White House pool. Mother praying with me every night before turning out the light as she let me in one of her best secrets. The universe is not a hard, cold, lonely, meaningless place, but a cosmos full of love. Mother never making a sarcastic remark about her children or anyone else and the lifelong self-confidence that gave me. Mother deep in conversation with cab drivers and giving her books away and money, personal phone numbers and her home address to hotel maids and other strangers. Totally, she decided she could help. Mother taking in practical detours to look at something lovely. Mother's horror at the harshness, as she put it, of so many evangelical religious people and the way they treated the lost. And her saying that no wonder no one wants to be a Christian if that's how we treat people. Then he said, maybe everything has changed for me theologically, but some things haven't changed. I'm still thinking of mom's eternal life in her terms because she showed me the way to that hope through her human consistency and one. Her example defeated my cynicism. Mom understood me and tried to speak when I said my last I love you. And then after a few words, he said, I'll miss her voice. I learned to trust that voice because of the life witness that backed it up. I know I'll hear her voice again. You won, Mom. I believe he was no longer an atheist. And God used the love of his mom to make him believe that God is true. That was a virtuous woman because of a virtuous Savior whom she trusted. Let us close in prayer. Our gracious, glorious God, we thank Thee, Lord, for Thy Word. We thank Thee for the example of this virtuous woman that embodies wisdom itself, that is in many ways a type of Christ who is the wisdom of God. And Lord, we confess as, as husbands and wives, as men and women, boys and girls, we, these are are things too great for us. But Lord, help us to see it as, as a goal. Help us to see it as Christ-likeness. And the thought that through Christ I can do all things. Help us, Lord, in our families, as husbands and wives, 
to seek these very virtues and to find them through the Lord Jesus, through his very work in our hearts. Help us, Lord, to apply ourselves to thy word and to the power of thy spirit that we would love our families, that as husbands we would love our wives, that we would love our children, that as wives and and mothers, that they would love their children and husbands and and seek this this family-centered life because of a Christ-centered desire. And we ask, Lord, that thou would then build thy church through family by family being blessed by thee, And wherever, Lord, there have been hearts where where we have not followed through, help us to simply keep at the foot of the cross, seeking the need and the guidance that comes from Christ and the forgiveness that we all need. For it is in His name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll be singing Psalter 179 in our doxology as... 291, 11 through 12 of 291, the last two stanzas in Psalter 179 first. Now the blessing of the Lord, and go in peace. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.